that. All right, welcome to uh, St. Louis Tableau User Group meeting for March. Um, super glad to have everybody here. Um, this is turning out to be, uh, you know, one of our uh, best months with the number of people registered. So hopefully we'll have uh, some good turnout. Um, I know that with both of the presentations that we have today and a little bit of fun with Tableau Trivia, um, it should be a really good meeting. So um, we'll go ahead and kick it off. All right, so for the agenda, um, running through the meeting kickoff now, um, then we'll have a discussion on data and analytics ethics with Jordan Durlester from RGA. Um, then we'll have some Tableau and DataViz trivia um, that is supported with some prizes. So um, the top three will be in the running for some prizes and um, everybody that participates will be eligible to win um, a free year of e-learning from Tableau. So a big thanks to Tableau for both the, the prizes for the top three, as well as providing that e-learning giveaway. Um, and then we have Jessica Cochran from RGA speaking about the right chart for your data story. And then at the end, we will have some networking. Um, I already mentioned this, but with the Tableau and DataViz trivia, um, make sure you participate. So uh, top three, like I mentioned, will win some Tableau swag. And um, one lucky participant will be randomly selected to win that free year of Tableau e-learning. Um, wanted to announce um, a new YouTube channel that's focused um, on sharing just data viz content um, kind of across the board, ranging from best practices, tips and tricks in Tableau, um, community content, but just things to help elevate your data viz game to the next level. Um, so if you sub scan this QR code, you can subscribe. Um, so I actually run this channel. Um, I'm focusing on putting out one viz a week in bite-sized pieces. So uh, ranging from two minutes to about 10 um, on a variety of topics. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, you know, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, open to feedback. Mentioned this last time and maybe just a few times before, but we're always looking for speakers. So if you're looking for an opportunity to, you know, push yourself to grow, um, we invite you to come speak at the St. Louis Tableau user group. Um, this doesn't have to be a technical discussion. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, an expert level uh, talk. Um, the best way I found to learn is to kind of put yourself on the spot and get out there and, and talk uh, and speak. So um, if you have anything that you think would be interesting to share with the group, uh, feel free to join us. I wanted to share a few things throughout the introductory presentation uh, that are going on in the community. Um, this is a really interesting one created by Kevin Flairlage. Uh, so he spoke last June to the group. Uh, he's a Zen master with Tableau and he created this data fam finder. Um, it leverages a lot of really cool technology uh, or techniques within Tableau, uh, including uh, dynamic parameters and some map functions. Um, but what it also does is it looks at everybody that is registered with this data fam finder and says, hey, within this region or this many kilometers of where you've clicked on the map, these so many people are in the data fam. So if you're unfamiliar with what the data fam is, it's the uh, affectionate name for Tableau fans um, all over Twitter, uh, LinkedIn, things like that. Uh, but I, I really recommend you get out there and, and scan this QR code, enter your information um there's no you know no commitment or anything like that but it's a great way for folks to be able to connect um so you know in st louis right now we're only showing four people including myself and uh i recognize a couple of those other names as being regular attendees of the tableau user group all right also we're always looking for feedback so if there's something that we do in the meeting that drives you nuts um, maybe it's just having to hear me talk at every meeting um, or if you think maybe we should do morning meetings or um, virtual coffee sessions or something like that please go ahead and um, scan this qr code it's a really quick google form uh, but if you complete that um, any respondents within the next month or so will be in the running for a tableau mug so uh, one respondent will be chosen at random to win that. Um, another initiative that's going on in the um, Tableau community is the March Madness Greatest Fantasy Challenge. Um, so 
the challenge here is to go through and choose uh, five team members out of some of the greatest NCAA tournament players of history. Um, and then the organizers of this challenge will take those five players and run simulations of games with all of those players in them. And the teams that have the highest points at the end, um, I think it, they're looking at points, assists, rebounds, blocks, and steals, um, will win surprises. Um, so this one's pretty easy to participate in. You click or scan that QR code. It takes you to the Tableau Public Viz. Uh, it's a really well done Viz, by the way. Um, you choose who you want, fill out a Google form, and uh, you can download a copy of your image. Also, we talk about the St. Louis Tableau user group LinkedIn group. Um, but go ahead and scan this. If you're not on that LinkedIn group, you're missing regular content from uh, the organizers of the group. All right, last but not least from the community um, is Ken Flairlage. So Kevin's brother, also a Zen master uh, and also a St. Louis Tableau user group speaker from back in um, June when we did the Zooming with Zen session. Um, he has a new Tableau Public Stats service. Um, so he's leveraging the Tableau Public API and uh, dumping everybody's data out to Google Sheets. Um, if you scan the link here, the QR code, it will take you to his website. You can sign up to have your stats sent to you via email um, or actually via a Google Sheet um, that you can access, um, giving you all the metadata behind uh, your business on Tableau Public. If you're not using Tableau Public, that would be a first step. Go out to public.tableau.com and uh, join in on the fun. And since we are open, um, if you have any questions or anything like that, I'm happy to address those. Um, otherwise, we will get ready to pass it over to our first presenter. And Elsa will introduce Jordan. Yeah, in the chat, um, someone liked the link to the March Madness. They missed the QR code. So if you just want to yep. throw it in the chat for them, that would be perfect. I will do that. Thanks. Um, yeah, so most of you know me. My name is Elsa. I'm one of the co-leads here um, for the St. Louis Tableau User Group. And um, today we're having another speaker from my company, RGA, which stands for Reinsurance Group of America. Um, his name is Jordan. He's pulling up his presentation now. Um, but Jordan is an executive director in our data strategy department that lives under our global data anal in the analytics department. Um, I've known Jordan really since I've started and um, he's been kind of a great mentor for me here at RGA and you just even kind of talking about different things with data. Um, and when we as co-leads were kind of thinking of different topics that we wanted to cover, one thing that came up was kind of data literacy um, and talking about, you know, how we've had kind of a trend when we've looked at different Tableau content of really talking about where is the data coming from? What do we need to be considering about the data when we build these types of reports? Um, and I thought he was perfect for this because I know he has a lot of discussions um, in our company and outside of it about data ethics and analytics. So um, this is really, I want to introduce him, but he's going to really talk about kind of how we as Tableau developers can really start thinking about data ethics and data literacy when we kind of go through building our report. So with that, I'll let Jordan kick it off. Awesome, thanks Elsa. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so also before I get into it too, I also sent a link in the chat to a book I just finished on this topic. Um, it's called The Ethical Algorithm. Um, I think it came out uh, in, in 2019, which in the grand scheme of things, as, as you think about it in terms of in terms of a book being published on this topic, that's that's about pretty much as recent as you're going to get. Um, so just I wanted to make sure I plugged that book as something that I really recommend. If this topic uh, is is of interest to you, if any of this, any of the stuff uh, I go over today is of interest to you, uh, definitely definitely recommend that read. Um, so yeah, so just a little bit more on the intro side. As as Elsa said, my name is Jordan Durlester. Uh, been with RGA for about four years now. Uh, prior to RGA, uh, I was at Centene for about four years as well over in their BI shop. And, uh, and I have uh, my bachelor's degree is in political science with a master's in public health where I really focused on, on econ and data modeling. And that's what really brought me into sort of the, the BI world in general. And so really excited to get to be here today and have this conversation. You know, one thing that David said that I think resonated with me uh, in his intro there about looking for speakers is 
Um, you know, I'll be the first to raise my hand and say, I don't, I would not consider myself a capital E expert on this topic. And I don't think that's because I'm deficient necessarily, but I would argue as we get into this, uh, nobody is really a pure data uh, ethics expert at this point in time. Uh, and so something just to keep in mind as, as we go through these slides um, that I wanted folks to think about. And really, um, when we look at the agenda here, we'll, you know, we'll go through a little bit about sort of who our GA is. I just want to just set the stage for how that um, sort of how that affects how I think about data ethics. Um, and then, sorry, I got a weird pop there. Um, right. And then we'll talk about sort of some examples, um, some a definition, some examples. And then I want to end on a couple just questions that I thought when I was thinking about what ethics might mean to a BI developer or somebody working within uh, within sort of a Tableau Center of Excellence, what would specifically be um, pertinent for you guys? So I have a couple a couple questions to kind of walk us through. And then at the tail end, uh, a slide that Elsa helped me put together with some specific uh, Tableau resources that, that will help on, on this topic overall. Uh, if you have any questions or thoughts or concerns, please, you know, this is a user group. Let's, let's treat it as such. So, so don't be afraid to jump in there with questions uh, along the way as well. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, so so I don't want to go into too much about RGA because candidly, I'm not really speaking from a from an RGA perspective today. This is me just kind of giving my overview. But there were a couple things that I wanted to point out about RGA about why I think um, it might be pertinent to to this discussion. So first and foremost, since this is mostly a St. Louis group, I imagine most of you know generally what RGA does. But but if not, we are we're a reinsurance player in primarily the life space, but also the health space as well. And, uh, and we're also a global organization. Uh, so we actually have, we have offices in 26 different countries and do business uh, in 80 of them. And so the reason why that's important for this topic, again, is when we think about data and analytics ethics, um, it's, 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 it's hard enough to talk about that uh, within a group of 20 people from the same community. But when you start to think about what that means to, you know, 4,000 employees, for an example, across the entire world, uh, what is, uh, you know, what may be firmly in the ethical, yes, no problem camp, uh, certainly might create some problems in a, in a different region or a different country. And so that's something uh, that, that we have to reconcile and something that I think everyone here has to think about in some capacity. And the second point is, again, uh, you know, we're dealing with, with morbidity and mortality. We're dealing with some, some pretty <laughs> arguably the most sensitive topics, right? If, if we were, you know, a CPG shop, if we were retail, I think sometimes, um, Sometimes it can be a little bit easier because sometimes the ethical questions that you're facing aren't as uh, don't necessarily carry the same amount of sensitivity. Um, and so, again, just something an additional level of complexity that, um, again, when I was looking at some of the folks that were joining here, I saw uh, some folks from, from Jones, of course, and some folks from Express Scripts. So definitely also dealing with some, some pretty sensitive topics, too. So um, that always, of course, shines a brighter light on, on, on the implications of this topic, too. So, OK, so when I was going to start to put together my slides, I was looking through some of the sort of standard given definitions of, of what data ethics is. Um, and then for two, one, I realized that a, there wasn't really one that I liked. And two, I realized if I'm going to a Tableau user group, I'm probably dealing with folks that are probably, uh, bigger fans of, of using visualizations anyway. So I, I found this a few months back and I, I love it for, for a lot of reasons in terms of, um, in terms of defining what data ethics is. So the first reason that I really love it is, um, it just it demonstrates what uh, what a quagmire this really is, right? Um, I think you know we're data people. Like oftentimes we like things to be pretty neat and linear uh, in terms of how we can how we can understand concepts. And uh, this is one that even the definition is, is always going to be a moving target, um, and it's never going to be something that can that can easily be defined. Um, so why does that really matter? So that matters because when you think about the entire analytic life cycle from um, from thinking about, you know, initially building a model and feature selection all the way through deployment and, and maybe creating some data visits on the back end, um, 
when something is when something is not so linear, it, it literally cannot be a check the box activity, right? This has to be something that there's not one specific throat to choke. There's not one specific owner of this because it's its tentacles are involved in each of these steps in very different ways. And so I love the idea that when you when you look at how they put this viz together, you've got, you know, you've got the green there, what you can technically actually build. Then you've got what your business wants to be able to do. You've got what legal says you can do. And I love that they put legal in that that dotted line because again that's something that's that's always always going to be changing as well and having huge implications and then you've got sort of somewhere in between uh you know they've they've got this moving target of the ethical position um, labeled there so I, I love it for that reason the second reason has to do specifically with that latter point around where ethics and um sort of the legal and regulatory world come together i think there can sometimes be this um this idea that um, data ethics is supposed to be, you know, it's, you know, just data privacy and, you know, infosec and, um, and, and, uh, you know, just sort of the, a lot of the basic, the basic IT and data um, exercises that can be put into pieces of legislation. So, but it's not right. What 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 I what I think is so important is it's important to differentiate. Ethics is not just the implementation of GDPR. It is not just the implementation of CCPA. It's 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 beyond that. It's saying it's it's making a statement that says definitively, we believe that there are certain things that even the regulatory bodies are trying their best to protect consumers in the right way. We definitively know there's going to be areas where they have not yet. Uh, put down letter of the law that allows for an easy yes or no decision. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about data ethics. So, so again, um, I, I just, I think this is a really great representation of why this is such a complicated and difficult um, topic to, to, to chew on. The, the last point I wanted to make on this slide, um, and this is semi stolen from, uh, from a, another speaker I heard talk about this, but I think when, when we hear data ethics, whenever you hear the word ethics period, I think, right, there's this idea that um, if you're gonna be an authority on this, you need to you know, have a degree in philosophy or you need to have read all the classics. I mean, ethics sort of carries that weight with it. But, but, I, think, uh, but I, I don't think that's true. And I think it's actually quite the opposite. I think when push comes to shove and you're thinking about data ethics, oftentimes what it boils down to is it's kind of common sense, right? It, it's, it's getting to these topics and decision points that ultimately, you, you know, it's, it's just the decision of does this feel right or wrong to you? Um, and and I, think, um, I think sometimes when we try and sort of put more sort of weight and sort of academia around that word ethics. I think it sort of takes away from the core, which is basically just us trying to say, hey, look, we know we're doing something here that could have some, some, some real consequences. And we want to make sure that we are aware of those consequences and are, are actively choosing to press forward or not press forward based on that. So um, yeah, so just I think that's an, an important piece to, um, to think about as well. Okay, so again, I think I think one of the best ways to really talk about this topic, as as opposed to just kind of waxing poetic about theory, is just to take a look at some sort of recent examples about about what um, what this actually means. And so, um, so many of you guys probably know and are are users of the app Ways, right? So Google bought the app Ways in 2013. It's, you know, I don't have the exact numbers, but it's certainly one of the most popular, um, you know, GIS um, apps that folks use whenever they have to hop in the car to drive somewhere. Um, and I think, you know, one of the ways that ways differentiates itself in a, in a good way is it talks about, hey, you know, where, you know, we are, the, the, this model was built on, you know, thousands and thousands of data points that Google had their hands-on and, and all their mapping and all their imaging, as well as um, getting fed in information from users and getting real-time updates on traffic. So it's gonna really, you know, Waze promises to give you the fastest route from A to B um, whenever you, you hop in your car. So, I mean, you know, you, you take a step back and if you think about that in a vacuum, that sounds like a pretty 
noble mission to have to help someone get from A to B uh, in the fastest amount of time possible using the most real time data that would be applicable. Um, and so, you know, that's that's the product they put out there. Um, I also believe that many of you probably know in 2017, uh, California uh, dealt with some some pretty horrific wildfires. Um, this picture is from, I think this is just outside LA County uh, from, from those fires. Um, and so I don't know how many of you know this story, but in 2017, these fires started um, to really, you know, go out of control and people in LA wanted to, you know, needed to evacuate, needed to get out of the valley, get out of where they were and get to someplace safe. So most people hopped in their car, grabbed their stuff, popped open the Waze app and put in, you know, hey, I need to get to Big Bear. I need to get to San Diego, wherever it was they needed to get to. And what Waze did was Waze took a look, as it always does, at what the most recent traffic data was. And, you know, wouldn't you know that, you know, Highway 5 and 101, two of the major, you know, two of the major um, highways at that point uh, were, were super open. And Waze said, hey, you know, go ahead and, and hop on these, you know, these two highways and get off at this exit, uh, yada, yada, yada. Um, but the reason those streets were so wide open, the reason the highways were so clear was because they were literally on fire, right? Um, but no one was there. And so the, the model said, hey, look, if you're, trying to, if you're trying to exploit traffic and get from A to B, this is the fastest way that you can get there. So, um, so obviously there's, there's a lot of, you know, it's, it's a pretty interesting use case from a lot of different perspectives. Um, but I, I think, I think it's really an interesting one to think about from an ethics perspective, because, um, while it's easy to look at that use case in hindsight and say, oh, wow, yeah, that's, you know, that's a problem. There's got to be sort of ways, programmatic ways we can go in there and try to say, hey, look, you know, <laughs> in certain in certain circumstances, there's probably um, different data sets that we probably don't want to be pulling from in, in, at certain times. But but uh, you know, but while that's you know, it's easy to Monday morning quarterback. If you put your shoes in the hands of one of those developers, and you think about the mission that they were trying to solve, you know, is it is it fair for us to say, hey, you should have expected this type of scenario to happen, and you should have had some sort of um, you know, way within your code that would say, hey, if, you know, if X, if there's some sort of natural disaster, then, you know, don't bring in traffic data at this time. You know, is that, is that a fair thing for them, for us, a fair complaint for us to lobby up at them from a development perspective? And then on a prospective manner, should, you, you know, uh, how, how do we, how do we take this example into what it is we're doing? And if we're talking about, you know, building and implementing models, what, you know, what does that mean in terms of how we need to think about unintended consequences? Um, so I think, I think there's a lot, a lot of meat on that bone. I'm, I'm going to move us along um, so we can get to sort of the, the questions at the tail end. But, but if, if this topic of interest um, is one of interest, you know, at the, the, in a few slides when I'm kind of at my questions for the group, um, please feel free to weigh in. But just, I think it's a really, Again, as I said, I think the best way to to take a look at understanding what data ethics is and its implications are to take a look at real life examples. And and you know, there's ten other ones I could I could have popped up on the screen here, as I'm sure most of you guys have heard a lot of them too. Um, but um, but yeah, so that's that's sort of the the ways story from from 2017. So, okay, so, so moving on a little bit, um, I don't know how many of you recognize uh, this, this guy or this show, um, but this is uh, from the show Silicon Valley. Uh, it was an HBO show, it ended a couple years ago. Um, it was a Mike Judge show, or kind of a tongue in cheek satire about really about big tech in general. And um, this, is, this is from the series finale and I, I don't wanna give away any any spoilers necessarily, because if you haven't watched it, you absolutely should. Um, but but the reason I the reason I bring it up is sort of the you know the show centers around ultimately this culmination of this decision where a group of individuals who started a company are faced with this decision where they built this product that is fantastic, um, but they uh, but they they have some inclinations that. What they built is is so smart and so good that the uh, the eventual 
uh, outputs of this of this tool are are such a threat to society that they have to decide if this is something they want to press forward with or if they want to kill altogether. And and um, so again, it's just a, a plug for the show. But the the reason I I, I really bring it up um, today is because um, this topic um, and even even in the show. They, they literally make fun of probably what I'm doing right now, which is talking about ethics and how we need to think about ethics. They, you know, because they talk about coining this term uh, tethics, which is tech ethics and how oftentimes, you know, they, people, data people sort of live in this ivory tower and, you know, we, we talk all this game about wanting to do good, but ultimately that really, you know, we're all here, corporate cogs, you know, trying to, trying to make money. And, and I bring this point up because I think if we're being candid, most people that don't work in this field, most lay people probably think that about us. I mean, they probably think, oh, you know, any company that's out there trying to use more data or use data in, in new and creative ways, they're probably, you know, they're probably doing it for some, you know, nefarious reason and they don't really care about doing good. And, um, and certainly there's enough, you know, there's enough evidence out there that there certainly are a lot of people that that is the case. Um, and people are not doing things for the right reasons. And so whether or not it's fair, I'm not here to say, but I think we um, as a cohort uh, really do have a responsibility and, and it's challenging because we kind of have PR working against us, but we have to do our part to make sure that that's not the case, that we are you know, self-regulating um, when regulation itself is not totally there and that we're talking about this and that we are, are letting people know in sincerity that this, this is an important topic to us and throughout all the companies that we work with and us individually with our own set of ethics and morals and that, um, and that we're, we're making sure that, and, and that what we're working on, what we're doing um, are, are for the right reasons and, and being done with the right protections on top. So just a, just sort of a, again, an interesting sort of talking point. So my, my last slide that I wanted to kind of open up uh, here somewhat for, for some conversation from the group too was, um, again, when I, when I put on my sort of BI hat, my Tableau hat, and I said, okay, talking to, talking to the Tableau user group, talking to developers, talking to folks working in the COE, you know, what are some, what are some specific questions uh, around how ethics is affecting decisions that are being made uh, by us, by, by, by this group of people. Um, you know, a lot of the discussions that we've had so far today have centered around feature selection and, and model building, um, which I, I have no doubt that some folks on this call do as well. But if we hone in just on that tail end and just on the sort of data viz side, I think there are, I think there are some pretty big crunchy questions for us to answer as well. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to just kind of run down the list of these four questions and give a little bit of a, a little bit of um, uh, context to some of them. But then I'd like to just candidly open it up and see if folks have any any sort of reactions to these questions or or, or the two use cases that we've looked at, or, um, and and then see how how that kind of goes from there. So my first one is around, you know, it's kind of a kind of the ultimate question, right? But is is data storytelling um, and and the the push to get folks to do more with data is that at odds inherently with data ethics? And the reason I ask this is because um, a lot of our jobs, I imagine, in some capacity, if it has to do with BI or working in a COE, is around pushing pushing more people to use data for more things. And if that is the case, if we're truly evangelizing this, if that's a a, a major part of what we're doing. Is that inherently at odds with um, with the idea of making sure that you're doing things correctly? I mean, if we're pushing so hard uh, to to do more, to do more, to do more, you know, what does that what does that mean? What's the implication there for the um, for the how we carry these out? So that was sort of my first question. Um, the next one had to do with kind of publishing a dashboard yourself, um, and if if we're responsible for publishing a dashboard. Um, do we have any obligation to talk to the people upstream who helped build this and put data together at the cube? Do we have an obligation to ask them about things like data collection and feature selection? Or do we say, hey, look, my job is to 
is to sort of run the COE. My job is to is to take this data set and make it look nice with a, a nice Tableau viz and, and I can kind of wipe my hands clean and say, I, you know, I did my part. Tied into that, um, what about who is looking at this dashboard and what decisions are being made off of it? Um, you know, again, if if my job is is as the COE is to help have a standard location and to let folks be able to, to take a look at some of the cool data viz uh, that on my organization is built, that's great. Um, but you know, what if I know there are certain limitations to those data sets? What if I know there are certain people looking at it that may not have an appreciation for some of these uh, topics or, or, or thinking about asking these questions? And if they're making decisions based off that, do I and do we as a sort of, you know, BI group have a responsibility to, to in some way uh, play, a, make sure that that sort of thing is, is not happening? And then the last question, a little bit more, you know, really kind of COE focused is, you know, what about training? I mean, so, you know, so much of what we do already, you know, we, we know how difficult it can be to get someone to move from doing all their work in Excel to saying, hey, look, this is this tool Tableau. It's awesome. It can do all these really cool things, but we know we're going to have to do, you know, training after training after training, answer questions and questions. And that's just part of it. So with that being, you know, a tough enough job in and of itself, do we still have an obligation to say, hey, also, it's um, it falls on us to make sure that we add into our training and in all of our communications that uh, thinking about ethical considerations is also a key part of what you're doing. And is that does some responsibility fall on us to make sure that that we're providing that level of, of, of training? So, OK, so I want to pause there again and open it up. Hopefully, hopefully, you know, with these questions or some of the some of the points I hit on earlier, bring up some thoughts, but I'd like to open it up or, or else I'm not sure if folks have been putting stuff in the chat, but any any additional thoughts or, or questions or responses to anything we've, we've seen so far? Yeah, we have had some in the chat. I definitely would love for you guys to you know unmute yourselves and kind of discuss what you're saying in the chat. This is Tanya. Um, so far, I have been fortunate enough to have control over all the data that I use in my viz. So I don't have to worry about that. But I don't think that I would feel comfortable with someone just giving me data and me making it pretty. I think I would have to know the story behind the data. Um, before I could um, feel comfortable creating anything else out of it. I, I think that's I think that's a, a great point. And and I would and I would expect and hope um, you know given given that that again that very very practical and rational sort of feeling that if you if you went to whoever it was providing that data and, and explained that, I would I would have to hope that that would be taken in the right way and 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 sort of understood, right? But you you wouldn't get you wouldn't get sort of negative pushback for that. I would I would I would really hope. Well, and we all know that you know, data, um, statistics in general, can tell any story that we want it to, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, um, so when you talk about uh, creating a dashboard and our decisions being made from it, um, you really have to, my, the way I work is when I'm creating the dashboard, I wanna know what you have in mind, what you're gonna use it for, because that's the data I want to highlight. Um, and a lot of times people don't know what they want until they see it and then they want something different. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, yeah, I think we have a lot of responsibility as um, publishers and especially as trainers, you know, so. Yeah, just my opinion. Hi, this is Charlie Marinero. I uh, completely agree. I think 
the word as an author of the dashboard the same way you would look at the author of uh, any nonfiction uh, publication, whether it's an article in the newspaper or, or some kind of a story that you are publishing, uh, it's up to you to vet it out so that what your readers are seeing, you've done to the best of your effort upstream downstream to to validate what you're looking at if it's coming from those numbers are coming from someplace else i come from a finance background originally and then to kind of piggyback on your uh second statement when you are working with people we're going through that at lamaris right now we haven't been Tableau dashboard ever since I came on two years ago. I've been just pushing hard and our chief actuary has, uh, he, he caught on to it right away. Some of the things that we use Tableau to do at Adventist Health out in California. And now we're in the process of a full scale <clears throat> building of a financial engine and, and, with a lot of pieces it's, that are going into the Amazon cloud and gonna Tableau will be what will be used to sit on top of it, uh, that that's even more important. And what we're going through now is to make sure the views that everyone that is going to see this, especially when it's going to health systems and doctors that it's accurate. Um, so yeah, if, if you consider yourself an author of this story, it's a non-fictional story. So uh, I just wanted to, to add that in. I thought that was a great topic to bring up. I, I like, I really like that. I really like that. Um, I, I, I haven't thought of that or heard that, that sort of comparison to just you know, it being, you know, being a journalist or a nonfiction writer, but it, it's, it really is, it, sh it should be sort of viewed that same way. I think that's a really, really good way to think about it. I, unfortunately, I have a hard stop. I have to go get my kids from daycare. I apologize. Um, but please don't let the conversation stop on, on, on me having to drop out. Um, there is my last slide here. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, bow out and let Elsa kind of speak to this and she can send links, but I know there are some very specific Tableau resources on this topic. Um, I would welcome the opportunity to come back and speak at, at, at a future one on this topic or another one, uh, or if folks want to just talk about this more in depth, um, uh, please reach out uh, and happy to have conversations or emails or whatever the case may be. Um, but I really do appreciate uh, that you guys for having me and, uh, and thank you guys so much. Thank you. Jordan. Yeah, and so kind of that point, um, we're definitely talking about, you know, how we can, you know, start talking about data literacy better and different topics to do for that. So if there was anything that, you know, you heard from Jordan's discussion there that kind of sparked an idea for you and maybe a topic you would like us to dive into more detail, please let us know. Um, we're always kind of trying to think of, you know, new ways to kind of look at how to use Tableau and what we need to consider as developers. So. Um, and let me pull up the last slide that he had that was about um, just the kind of resources that we have from Tableau's aspect. And apologies if you hear my dog playing with his toys a little loud today. Um, so really these were just some of the resources when I was kind of talking with Jordan that we thought would be helpful. Um, the first is Data Literacy for All. This is a really new program that Tableau has. Um, where they recognized that a lot of people that were developing needed to have more data skills and understand what exactly is happening with the data. And, you know, when they're building a calculated field to really understand what they're doing and why and understand that better. Um, and so they've actually launched this program. It's a free e-learning program. Um, I don't think it's too much content. I can't remember the amount of hours. I think it's around eight or so, four to eight. Um, but it's really just a program to kind of help people get back up in those kind of data skills, especially if that wasn't maybe your traditional path when you kind of got Tableau, maybe you come from a different background and now use Tableau. 
it's kind of a great way if you're kind of starting to get hands-on with data. Um, definitely recommend it because it's just giving you best practices when it comes to working with data. Um, and on that, they also have an assessment quiz and I'll send all these links, but they also have an assessment quiz where you can go and basically kind of say, you know, where are you in your path in Tableau? And it'll provide you different resources, different articles, even e-learning things um, to kind of help you fill in those gaps that you might have. So it might be that your data skills need help or your data visualization. But um, if you're kind of looking at this and thinking, oh, I've never really thought about how I deal with data um, in this kind of way, there might be kind of a resource out there for you from Tableau. So I definitely recommend taking this assessment quiz just to get kind of that you know, level set of where do you need to work on your skills with Tableau and how to kind of grow that um, skill set for yourself. The third one is a, a product you would actually have to purchase from Tableau. It's called Tableau Data Catalog. Um, this is something that is on your server that as part of the data management package. So if you're someone that does have, you know, more of a Tableau server instance, you've probably heard of this um, from your Tableau team. But really what it is, is kind of a data catalog. So it does a lot of those um, things that a traditional data catalog does if you're able to see you know which kinds of things are getting populated um you know see which columns are used most where the calculations are coming from builds upon ask data um, they've really kind of grown this product in the past year or so um, but if you are seeing this and thinking wow my company really needs to start kind of looking at different things when it comes to data ethics having a data catalog is you know usually kind of Part of the solution is to being able to transparently know what's happening with your data, who's using it, why, all those kinds of questions. And Tableau Catalog is one of the ways that you may be able to answer those. Um, and last but not least is a new feature from Tableau. Dave could kind of correct me when this came out, but probably in the past year. Um, and it's collapsible containers. So you probably noticed with a lot of the new dashboards is like a little help or like little instructions that you can click on and a container opens up and it gives you all this information. People are putting visits within those. There's lots of cool things you can do. Um, but the reason I brought that up is that we've seen a lot of people use it to give data definitions and to explain what is this chart doing? So like how a couple of you brought up, um, making sure that you're really considering when you're doing data storytelling that you're telling the correct story and that you're doing it in an accurate way and making sure people understand what the data is saying and the data definitions behind that. And classable containers can be a great resource for that because it's not taking up that precious white space of a dashboard, but you're giving someone easily accessible information about the data behind it. Um, and it's very customizable for whatever you need and whatever kind of considerations you have. So these are just a few resources that if you're about to kind of step back from this and say, how do I apply any of what Jordan was kind of mentioning. These are just a few things to kind of get you started. So I apologies, Jordan had to run, but um, if you guys do have questions for him, I can definitely make sure he gets those as well. But um, we just knew this was kind of an important topic to kind of start thinking about because data literacy is a hot topic when it comes to Tableau and definitely data ethics sits within that and is really something, you know, for all of us to kind of start considering when we are truly doing data storytelling, making sure you know, we're considering what story we're telling and why. Um, so yeah, so I'll kind of wrap it up for Jordan, but thank you everyone for kind of commenting. If you guys have other comments, please unmute yourselves. We'd love to hear you. This is David Roscoe from Doe Run Company. I guess to maybe expand on that journalism analogy, I think, you know, I think journalism is pretty complicated as far as, you know, what is facts and what do you start with and you know, what type of story are you telling? You know, are you, depends on your role in the company, right? If, if you're more in a change agent role and you're trying to get people to be aware, you know, and you're trying to create transparency around the operations and how the organization's doing, you know, that might be sharing data that makes people uncomfortable, even if it's the, you know, the truth. So uh, I know in my experience, it's definitely, it's fairly complicated, especially if you're in that role where you're, you're inheriting other people's data, um, but it's may not be information that they want to share up and down the organization because it makes them feel uncomfortable. Um, but then there's also the expectation around what data is and you know, what's, what's the proper vetting process, how much testing and validation is appropriate. Are people aware of what phase the, you know, the data collection is occurring? So, 
know, is this just a development, you know, is this just a development dashboard or is it, you know, is it certified data source, some of that kind of stuff. So um, it can get complicated pretty quick to say, you know, this data is just the facts, ma'am. Um, so, uh, you know, I definitely appreciate the topic because especially if you're involved in every part of that, that process, you take on a lot of ownership, especially if you don't have the resources or internal staff to do, you know, whatever that determining what that appropriate level of validation is. Yeah, I completely agree with that. Awesome. Well, yeah, we hope to have more topics like that. because I think it is really, really interesting kind of thing for us to consider when we're kind of developing dashboards and really looking at how we actually are using these reports. So yeah, with that, I'll, I'll kind of kick it over to, I believe, Dave or Sean. I don't know which one of you is next, but looks like Dave. <laughs> yeah, it's me. Um, so yeah, big thank you to Elsa and Jordan for that presentation. Um, so I mentioned earlier, we're going to try to mix it up and have a little bit of fun here. So um, not that the prior parts weren't fun, but um, or that what's coming next isn't, but um, going to try a Kahoot. So if you can go to a browser and join us at kahoot.it um, and then enter the pin that's on the screen, um, we will get started. It even has some great background music. Sean, did you customize that? Remember, we have prizes up for grabs, so uh, really recommend you participate. I made it up in my uh, basement, David. <laughs> Do it. We'll start it at uh, 3.55, so about two more minutes for everybody to sign in. And if you've used something like Data Viewer or Less Data Traveler um, and you win, I'm going to need to know who you are. And Dude, and you know, folks like maybe Mark or MG, so. You can ping me directly, if you win, ping me directly via the chat in Zoom. All right, just one more minute. Oh, did Dave's comment? Someone asked about, uh, you know, their username. If you win, you'll just message him at the end and let him know if you have a name that we don't know who you are. Let me take a screenshot of everybody who's here so we can give away our um, year of e-learning, but uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Here we go. Most people went with true, so uh, 
We'll see what happens, see who's on the leaderboard after question one. So if you're unfamiliar with Kahoot, I maybe should have told you this, but uh, speed to answer, uh, you have to answer correctly to get points, but speed gives you more points. So sitting at the top, we have Kelly Z, Kriyesh, and Alyssa Chapman. On to the next question. And uh, you'll notice that some of these are already tied to data literacy. So uh, a, a good kind of tie-in with what we've talked about uh, just a moment ago with Elsa. So this one I think is a little bit tricky the way it's written, um, but uh, when making decisions, they're saying um, it's better to, you know, if you have the right data, you should be able to make a true decision. So you shouldn't just continue to go after additional data, um, you know, to that end. So um, most people got that one right as well, or wait, no, sorry. Most people got that one incorrect. Um, yeah, so what they are saying is exactly what I said. Use the data that you have to make an informed decision. Um, but I think this one's written very um, confusingly. And I'll tell you that we didn't necessarily write those. But uh, we have uh, a change at the top of the leaderboard. So uh, data viewer, uh, Natalia and Tanya. So there's, there's still uh, quite a bit of time to make up your score. So eight more questions. Here we go. And I'll tell you on this one, there are three correct answers. All right, so this is great. So, um, Dashboard developers, analysts, consumers definitely have to, um, you know, be aware of data literacy concepts, right? So developers need to be aware of to whom they're developing, right? And I think Jessica is going to speak about that. Analysts need to be able to understand data and read data so that, you know, they can um, be effective in providing their analysis. And we should also keep in mind the consumers that we're providing our dashboards to. Um, if they don't have um, if they don't have a level of uh, data literacy, it's kind of all for naught, right? So um, let's see what happened in the leaderboard. Natalia, highest answer streak. Way to go, Natalia. Sitting at first place. Uh, I hope I don't mess up your name, but Surgeon at second, Becky in third, and it's getting tight uh, between SM and Stu for fourth and third or fourth and fifth. Next question. So there's a, a video clue here. Hello, I'm David Vileka, and today we're talking about dashboard layout. Assuming that you have all of the correct elements on your dashboard, the appropriate charts, important metrics, and necessary pieces, without a well thought out design, it could all be for naught. Unfortunately, many times so much effort is spent building out impressive charts that by the time we get to the dashboard, less attention is paid to how all of the pieces fit and play together. Think about your dashboard as a jigsaw puzzle. You may be able to fit the pieces together by brute force, but if you put them together in the incorrect places, you'll end up with a misshapen mess that doesn't look anything like it is supposed to. Fortunately, dashboards are a bit more forgiving. There's no one right way to build your dashboard, but there are definitely better ways. Let's look at some of the theory behind laying out an effective dashboard. All right, so it's just a, just a little bit of a snippet, but that's one of the DataViz Mastery uh, videos. And I promise you, I didn't build this, but it is a great commercial. So here's your question.
All right, so the correct answer here is um, that we should not use many colors in our dashboard, right? So we need to make sure that when we use colors effectively, um, that you know there's three to eight colors, right? Um, because we know that the human eye can only discern differences between um, a, a certain number of colors. Uh, for females, it's a little bit more, but for males, uh, it's it's really between that four to eight. Um, so as we use colors across the dashboard or across the visualization, we want to make sure that they're used purposefully and effectively. So here we go with the leaderboard. Natalia extends her lead. Uh, SM up into second and Stu up into third. Uh, Elizabeth right there on the cusp as is MS. So keep going. All right, so um, kind of to the point of less is more here. Um, so if you put too many views into your dashboard, um, you're going to get information overload. So what we should really do is give only the, the key three or four views. Uh, a dashboard that has 27, di 27 different metrics and uh, various uh, subject types is not effective. Um, so we did pretty good here. 21 out of 26 got this one right. And here's the leaderboard. Natalia extends her uh, her lead as well. Well, actually, the lead might have shrunk just a little bit, but keeps that uh, win streak going. Um, still in first, SM in second, and Stu in third. Um, a slight change in fourth and fifth with MS intrusion is coming right back into the game. So I think we have three more questions or four more questions. So this is the show me panel um, in Tableau. So if you use Tableau at all, you know that when you go into build a viz, uh, unless you uh, unselect the show me, this box will show up. So let's see what the question is. All right, so that was a tree map. Um, so a highlight table would typically be um, effectively a cross tab uh, with a, a row highlighted or cells highlighted. Um, and a highlight map would be quite similar. Um, tree map, correct answer here. Let's move to the leaderboard. All right, so no change at the top. So st top five remain the same. Natalia, I think your lead's shrinking just a little bit. Second to last question. All right, a line chart is the correct answer here. Um, I guess you could use a bar chart, but uh, I think that we would probably uh, get more value to see that trend over time via a line chart. All right, oh, into fifth place comes Becky. So uh, just a little bit of movement up here. In, um, so now we have four players with a win or a, a answer streak of five. So uh, here we go, next, or actually last question. So the magic quadrant just came out. Tableau has been in the leader quadrant for how many years? This one could really shake it up. All right, so uh, nine years running for Tableau. So um, really this one, it's kind of up for grabs um, unless you uh, read Magic Quadrant uh, or Gartner's output. So I guess at least 18 of us have looked at that. So um, here we go with the final rankings.
Natalia, seven out of eight questions. Oh, there were 10 questions though, so I don't know what that quite means, but. Uh, Natalia in third, MS in th second, and Stu jumped at the last minute up to first. Um, so, SM and Elizabeth, so all five of you, I will reach out to you um, regarding your prizes. So I'm gonna need to know who MS is. Um, oh man, how do I find that back? Back to podium, one sec. So I need to know who SM and um, Stu are. I think Stu is Stuart Dunlap, but I don't know who SM is, or MS. So ping me in the chat, please. There's also view full report when you clicked next, so. Okay, so I didn't have to make everybody watch that again. <laughs> well, sorry for that. <laughs> All right, so um, I hope everybody enjoyed um, kind of a change of pace and trying something new. Um, so I will reach out to the three people that won. Um, so uh, yeah, definitely, um, Speed is definitely the key in those cahoots. So great job to everybody that participated. Hopefully uh, something there was interesting or you learned something. Um, and we also have somebody selected as our random our random recipient of the e-learning. Um, and that person is, drum roll please, Sumitra. So Sumitra, if you can please contact me directly with your email address. Um, you should be able to direct message me in uh, Zoom and we will uh, get you that code. All right, so great job, everybody. Um, moving on, um, we are going to have Miss Jessica Cochran speak to us. Um, so Jessica, if you're, I hope you're ready. Okay, so Jessica is speaking to us today yeah. about uh, choosing the right chart type for your data um, and kind of expanding on the story that she told us or the presentation she gave us last summer uh, regarding um, data storytelling. So uh, this will be a very interesting presentation, I'm sure. So uh, without further or any further ado, Jessica, we'll kick it to you. All right. Um, of course, my doorbell just rang. So I think it's a pesky little seven-year-old. So we're just going to work through it and ignore it. And it'll be just lovely to have on the recording. So. I'm going to share my screen. I made it this whole hour without any of that interruption. But anyway, so hey, so glad to be here. Yes, I'm Jessica Cochran. I'm a data storyteller at Edward Jones in St. Louis. I'm excited to be back and share more with you all since my visit last summer about going from design to data. On that note, David's right. You do not have to be an expert. I think I scored in 21st place in that trivia. So. Uh, but I, I promise I have something good to share with you today. And I'm really humbled by this Tableau community, both locally and uh, globally. I enjoy the experience to connect and learn from one another to get better. So I hope I can add value today to your Tableau and data development. I'd like to share my story as a reminder of where I'm coming from in this conversation. So you know who I am. I'm coming from a place where I don't know if I'll ever feel new or not feel new in the data world because I spent 19 years of my career in marketing as a designer and storyteller. I'm an artist um, through and through. I enjoy hand fine art and it's why I probably do well as a designer. So, but this June will be two years for me in the data world and even knowing that Tableau exists. And on that note, um, another detail is I only do the biz side of the work. So here we go. I paint data. Google is hilarious. I wanted to find an image with the term painting data and Google did not disappoint and it distracted me from my point. So, <laughs> so we'll get started with the lesson today. Um, between my desire to learn about building visualizations with data as quick as possible in my role and this discovery that people in data enjoy standards and guidelines, I've been partnering with a teammate of mine and friend Julie Toll to create a playbook of how to pick and design the best chart for your data story. So today the three steps we'll go through are how to pick the right chart to tell the right story, how to ensure your chart shines and shouts its message, and how you can bring standardization and education to your team. Um, 
so that you can share effective data stories that drive action. So just wanna say this, feel free to enjoy this moment. I'll share my slides after the event. So I know I like to take screenshots. So don't make words do all the work. Showing is more powerful than telling when it comes to directions and data trends. We love visuals, images, charts, and infographics because humans are visual creatures. We absorb information and learn quicker with the support of visuals. So it's imperative to pick the right visual and better yet the right chart to tell our data story. While we are discussing direction for a single chart here today, I'll show you how to bring it all together in a full dashboard as well at the end. Most, if not all of us are familiar with that Tableau Show Me feature to help guide to selecting the right chart type. We just saw that in the trivia. I select a couple dimensions and a measure and Tableau will help me pick an effective chart. This is a great place to start and to explore picking a chart. But as you know, life isn't always that simple. And I know I'm unique and so are my problems. So probably yours are too. Whether we're tasked with a single chart or a dashboard viz, there are considerations we must understand to deliver the best output. So here are high level considerations that I wanna understand before I go into creating a chart. These are ordered specifically the way you see on screen to understand how to produce the final chart. This order of exploration informs the next question you ask. I'll take you through each one quickly so I can show you an example. So the first place is the initial request. With the requests, we must be responding to a business objective to answer. So partner with your client or business and get them involved to help their data education. Ask questions like, what is the one question you wanna answer about the area of focus? Why is this is an important question to answer? Um, what are they trying to understand or what business decisions will be made from understanding the data? And second, who's the audience? The audience could be your executives or C-suite. It could be management level, analysts, or maybe a broader public audience. But with the audience, it's helpful to understand their level of knowledge and comfort with data literacy. Moving on to the output, I, I know I wanna know what is the end use? Will this be used in mobile or desktop? Can I publish this to Tableau server or do they need an image? And this information will begin to inform the design of the visual and the experience. And next, I wanna know how much time I have to create the chart. Do I have an hour? Do I get a month? This could determine how much context I can add to the story. With the information we now have about the project, we can begin to get down to specific details to create the chart. We can start to ask about the data. So here we can understand what data sources we need, specific data points to use in the chart. If there's a need to create new calculations to get desired data measures, and will there be a need for filters for interactivity? We can get even deeper into those data requirements by understanding how they should be displayed in a chart. If the output allows for interactivity, we can have the end user explore deeper into the data and have some real fun there. We can explore options to help the chart tell a great story by adding more context through comparisons to previous dates, uh, maybe even add more context in a tooltip with more data or a new viz. So that was quick, but I hope you saw how each step ordered this way helps lead to inform the next questions you ask. If you wait until the end to find out that the business only wants a chart in the PDF, you might have wasted too much time asking about the data and chart requirements and exploring the possibility of interactivity and additional context built into the tooltips. When you address these questions, you're taking a strategic leadership approach to your work to help others understand the data so they can ultimately take action. This process of exploration can help you gather all the info and details up front that will lead to success in your design. Without the full understanding of these items, you could find yourself in a place where you need to start over. You might have to go back to the business to ask more questions or possibly provide an undesirable chart that misses the mark. Leading with these questions up front will bring confidence to your work and create a stronger chart and data story. At the end of this presentation that will be shared afterwards in the appendix, I share resources that provide 
a template of questions I know I will be using with our teams. So if you see this image of this trail, can you tell where this trail is going? It looks like maybe a bird landed, jumped around in the snow and then flew off without any clues on direction. And this is what it might feel like for us as we begin a new project. But that's why we have the steps I shared with those exploratory questions to help us find direction. So let's see what this looks like in an example. I meet with the client and I use my questions to find out that the business has a few questions of their own that they're trying to solve for in their business. Uh, okay, sales, looking at trends and customer locations. So that's a great start. My client will be sharing this data with their management and their stakeholders. And so the client feels like the audience has a decent level of knowledge of data, but the direction is I still must make the story be direct. They're going to publish their data to Tableau server, but they're also gonna pull images of the charts into their presentation for their updates and department meetings. So interactivity for the online experience will be great, but I gotta make sure I can't hide all the info for those future presentation needs. They've given me one month. That's nice, right? To create the visual to tell the data story. This should be a good for a dashboard with three questions, which will give me plenty of time to explore the data, do the design and validate and test. To create my visual, I'm going to access the data source to focus on some dimensions, order date, category, and I need that measure of sales but I might be able to explore more of the data if I think I could add value of greater context to the requested data questions. I might be able to add context into the tooltips and give a broader story. Now seeing the objectives for the chart, I really might be able to use more of the data to bring deeper knowledge to the story. These objectives help me understand what the business really wants to see and explore. And because they told me that they'll be publishing to the server, I know I can deliver on these objectives. But again, I need to consider the output for the presentation or provide solutions they can use when presenting the full story. So as a new person to data world, um, I found this diagram. I wonder if you've seen it before. I know there's lots of versions out there. It's a really cool decision map for chart selection. That's really cool. I do have a link to it, so don't worry, it's a little fuzzy here on the screen, but it's one of the better ones I've seen in the way that it groups all the chart types together. So I'm gonna use this as a guide for selecting the right chart. I'm going to start in this middle section and see where I need to go. I'm beginning to see a path to some good chart type options based off my three data questions. I think in general, a couple of my charts will be comparing category sales and one of those will be using time as a measurement. So those are at the top circled in green. I automatically think of a map to indicate location. So that's pretty easy. It's tracking the distribution of where my customers are located. So let's see, how I'll do this. I'm going to use an example that our team used for a Viz challenge last month in our personal Tableau user group. So some of you might recognize this. So my first question is, what are my sales per category? So I'm thinking of a column chart. <clears throat> if we had time with all of you here today and some interactivity, I'd love to hear your ideas, but nope, it's all about me. Selfish me, my ideas, so too bad. But here's my direction for the question. All right, like I said, I'm gonna use a column chart and I'm going to put the sales on label so the client can immediately see the measures. And because the bars are labeled, I can remove my axes to reduce chart clutter as I call it for a clean look. And I'm going to apply color to the categories so I can begin to use color as part of the story for my other questions. And because the client will be able to interact with the data, I wanna make sure I include details for tooltip features beyond the data that was asked. My second question is what are the trends over time? And based on experience I've had and what the chart type decision tree showed me and what we also heard in trivia today, I think I wanna use a line chart next and the lines are gonna show the trends over time by the filter I set. And here are those lines, pretty pretty. On the chart, I will not use labels because again, I don't want that cluttered appearance. 
And because this will be published, it'll be easy for the client to see the measures and a tooltip treatment when they hover over the lines. I'm using the color legend from the first chart to create that continued consistent color story for the categories. My last question is, where are my customers located? Again, I'm, I'm gonna use a map. Seems like the best idea to solve the question and create a strong visual story. Maps are very recognizable and should be very intuitive for the client. So right here in the map, I put the customer count on color and size to show the states with the highest number of customers. That can be seen with the darkest shade of gray and the lar largest circle shape. I added the count to label so the client could immediately inter interpret the map and where the greatest or lowest number of customers are located. And since I'll be able to use tool tips, I included details to add context for greater understanding of the data. So now that I built the charts with some of our design principles that we use here at Edward Jones, I'm ready to take it to the next level for a great story. So I'm going to show the details behind the charts, <laughs> the charts that make them shine. So when I brought my first chart into the dashboard, I saw opportunity to help tell the client what the data was telling them and add more data for deeper understanding behind the results. So first I created a calculation that would create a dynamic headline that would tell the client which category was leading in sales. It reinforces the data, the story I want, and refreshes as the data updates. Next, I created a viz to add into my tooltip that would break down the category to show the subcategory sales contributions to the overall sales measure. And finally, I created separate measures that calculated the overall category percentage of sales to look at the data from a different perspective. As you can see, I brought in some pretty graphic icons to add recognizable cues to the category names. I'm gonna just refer to that to, as the glitter to the shine of the chart. For trends, I created the same kind of dynamic headline to tell the client what we want the chart to tell them. So this is an addition to the trend data. This actually tells them about the greatest growth in the trend over time. And I added a similar viz in the tooltip with the subcategory sales details. And in this tooltip, I had to have the category sales because again, they're not instantly seen in the visual chart. And in the last chart, this dynamic headline tells the clients which state has the greatest count of customers. So again, adding to the data story. The viz tooltip shows the count of customers, the total sales and the viz of the category sales. And finally here, I actually took this one a step further with the data to show a stack bar chart representing the top 10 states by sales for more details in the story since I had you know, a little extra time. That month was really nice to me. So this dashboard challenge for us was actually a very quick challenge to use our design and story principles into answering data questions. But hopefully um, you see how I use those exploratory questions to solve the dashboard as well. There could be many ways to solve this, this data story differently or add even more data to the story, but I hope you can see how I brought the example to life. Again, just a reminder of that final consideration on output, if these charts are used in a presentation or static image, you know, while I can grab screenshots, I might need to add that context back in later on from the tooltips. So the dashboard example I shared demonstrated how to pick a chart and build it into a dashboard to make it shine. But the next step our team has been working on is bringing our process and standards of chart selection into an educational tool for all of our data story creators. When I presented last summer, I shared a toolkit our team was creating to document design and data standards along with process approach and guidance to our work. So we're all in alignment. And our toolkit has four sections. It guides on design principles based off our company standards and brand, data standards and best practices guided by the expertise of our team, and information about our team and how to engage when solving data biz work. Finally, it has a training and education section, which is coming into play here. 
So this is what we call a living document that evolves with new discoveries and testing. And as you can see, it was just updated this month. So when it comes to the chart type criteria guidance, I wanted to show you how we formed our tool, if this is of interest to you. In order to create our standards, we research experts in the field to form our standards. We didn't just take one viewpoint off the shelf and apply it. We gathered insight from multiple sources in partnership with our own expertise and in alignment with our organization's standards and governance to create a toolkit with guidance for our users. And one of our major partner resources we use in this toolkit is Andy Kreeble's Visual Vocabulary Tableau, which is out on the uh, Tableau Public site. So again, my fondness for the Tableau community, I love the willingness to share knowledge so we can all get better together. And this tool starts with the data relationship to determine the right chart type. If you interact and click on each section, it will give you a selection of charts that align. And this breakout, uh, breakout window shows the deviation chart section if you were to click on it. At the end of last year, we started building an engaged Tableau user community at Edward Jones, and we began connecting with more of our users to understand their needs and use of Tableau. And one of those opportunities was to provide guidance on choosing charts based off specific criteria and with standards applied. So, this would also bring alignment with our own firm design standards being created by our ISUX user experience group and marketing who create client facing digital tools that use data visualization. So this is aligning all of our design areas of the company together. So this is our beginning phase of our work to test and share. We identified the charts we use and see the most in our dashboards. It also demonstrates our design system standard elements of color and font style. And when our users spend more time with this kit, the more they're influenced by the system to follow its standards and creation of dashboards. When the, the user hovers over each of these charts, they'll see the chart definition and recommended use, and this will add additional education on chart types. We share this in partnership with Andy's visual vocabulary. Andy's starts with the goal of the data to lead you to the right chart type. And our tool starts at the chart type level while bringing in our specific design and data standards. For our team, our next step is to continue to build out this chart type criteria experience to help guide our designers on formatting and execution of our design standards. So this will create a consistent and expected experience that will add sophistication and credibility to all our work under the company brand. So our next build out will allow the users to download this workbook to dig into formatting of the chart so they can self teach in the process. And this stage is in process now and will hopefully be ready in a couple months for our users. But a new tool is as only as good if people know about it. So we're in the current process of promoting and educating to our users on this work some are getting a preview today with you, but those who cannot attend will share this out at our next monthly Edward Jones community event. We are creating this team, this team site, um, Microsoft SharePoint experience to house our resources and provide education, onboarding, and to share announcements of news and events, including today's event. We're excited about the success we're creating within our group of 125 plus users. And they're helping us create relevant and desired content, providing mentorship to new users. And best of all, they're helping us become a more mature data-driven organization. So today, our overall goal is to help you learn how to pick the right chart. And when picking the right chart, you got to find the purpose that creates a consistent approach to problem solving with data, maintain a big picture view of the project, and increase stakeholder involvement in education. It also helps you quickly identify priorities, issues, options, and milestones. Once you understand the purpose, bring the data story out and let it shine. Don't hide it under too much noise and clutter. Tell the end user what they need to know and make it easy. So paint that data. In the end, don't hoard this information to yourself. Help those around you get better and create alignment with standards. 
be the leader and guide with your expertise. Thanks for being here. If you wanna connect, here's some information on how to find me. I'll leave it up for a second, but I'm done. Mic drop. Hey, Jessica. Um, great, great session. I really enjoyed it. I There's a lot of what you've just talked about um, that I'm gonna steal. Um, awesome. Yep. So, uh, I mean, it's a great opportunity for knowledge sharing, right? Um, and if we don't, we don't do that, um, and you know, help drive each other forward, then what's the point? So, uh, great job, um, Jennifer. Just wants to say, great job, friend. So, uh, Aww, thanks, Jennifer. Man, two Jennifers. So, um, you know, you got your cheering section here pretty strong. So, um, <laughs> but are there any questions uh, for Jessica? Um, so the best way to get the slides, so I can definitely share um, Jessica's slides. Uh, she sent those over to me earlier today. So those will be going up on the Tableau, or sorry, the St. Louis Tableau User Group LinkedIn page. Um, so that's where we will post those. Um, with regards to the slides for um, Jordan, um, we're still waiting to make sure through RGA that he's able to share those. Um, so uh, Elsa will probably be able to update us on that in the next few days, uh, but keep an eye on that Tableau user group, um, LinkedIn group. So I can share the details. I can put that uh, slideshow back on, on loop for um, folks if they're interested. Um, but at this point, um, we are gonna break out and anybody that wants to hang out for networking um, we have that as an option. So Jessica will stick around um, for at least a little bit, I think, unless she has to go to our door. Um, but uh, if you have any questions for Jessica or anybody else, um, so Jessica, David Roscoe is asking if you could go over the dynamic titles. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, so I, <laughs> well, I didn't have the Tableau workbook uh, but you, you can create calculated fields that, um, you know, if, if your filter is set like to this month of data um, to pick your, your top sales or, or top field, and when that is done, give me um, the, the correct name. And you could do if this, then that kind of calculations. Um, I, like I said, I am an artist, I am a designer, I am getting through calculations and data because I do see its value. If you want to find me um, on the side, send me a message and can even do like a one-on-one -on -one session and I can share my, my workbook and show you how I did it. Um, I'm not as fluent in, in calc speak. I can do it but to just riddle off right here uh, what I actually did. But I, I love private conversations if you want to take this offline. Yeah, I think the ca calculated fields that I've done before are linked to actions. Is that what you said, Jessica? Um, I did not link to actions. Um, I've been doing some work lately where we're actually like pulling in insights and statements to say, you know, this month, this group had a higher uh, growth rate than this population. And we're actually writing it out into calculated, I'm using calculated fields. I'm not saying you can't do an action, you prob probably can. Um, so I think I, I'm using kind of if this, then this kind of statements and then creating my text and putting that calculated field in that part of the statement, if that makes sense. Mm, sure. Yeah, that's interesting. Thanks. Oh, good. Sounded somewhat intellectual. I like it. Uh, Jessica, on that, like the second to last slide or maybe third to last slide, um, you were showing um, like a highlighted chart and the others were grayed out. Um, so the question is, did you have the chart highlighted when you hover and the other ones gray out or was that something that you prepared as a, just a visual to highlight. On this, like this slide right here. Um, hold on. I'm trying to share back with you guys. I think that's a slide. Uh, Priyash was asking. Priyash, you can, you can unmute yourself. 
Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, so that's that's the one I was wondering. Uh, so, so is that more so that the users will be looking and focusing on that chart and everything else kind of grays out? Is that um, built I, it or I just, is it just for this presentation? I just did it for this presentation. If you, um, hmm, now you got my my wheels I know how to do spinning. It. If you, you do, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I just did it for the presentation. I just tricked it in PowerPoint, but. If you want to reach out, Priyash, I can, I have a, I saw that and I thought, man, that's cool. I know how to do that. Okay. Um, Maybe we so. should all call you David. No, I don't have that much. <laughs> no, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. I was curious to see, you know, how to grab that attention, right? There's like so many data points on the chart always, and the users always want to see more and you always want to show them less. So there's yeah. always a struggle between showing the right charts and the right data versus, you know. Yeah. So it's really interesting. I, just like as a how I would do it is I would create that chart, right? And then I would create a separate um, chart that hovers over everything because now we can layer things in Tableau and we can play with transparency. Um, and you can drive it through parameter actions on a hover. Um, you know, there's nothing on that on whatever you hovered over. So that top left one that you hovered over, Jessica, there's nothing there. And then on everything else, you have a, a gray square that is, you know, I don't know, 70% mm -hmm. transparent. Right. Um, and, you know, it does what you want it to do from a visual perspective. Your tooltip can hover on top of that um, because you'll put your tooltip on your your masking layer. Um, but I'm happy to, I'll mock something up because like I said, I thought it was cool. Mm. Yep. It's Thank not a, guys. it's definitely not a practical use for like everyday business purposes, but um, I could definitely see some opportunities. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, like, thank I you. like the questions. Yeah, do like a YouTube instructional video and share that. Um, that's well, I was even another... thinking that the, sh the hide and reveal button features. Yeah, with the collapsible containers that Elsa mentioned, we could do yeah. something there too. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Jessica and David. Appreciate yeah. it. All right. Um, does anybody, I mean, any, this is an open forum at this point. So um, any other questions? So the LinkedIn group, let me just put this on play and we can always talk over it. Uh, but the LinkedIn group is the St. Louis Tableau user group. Um, so if you scan Scan this uh, QR code, it'll get you there. Um, so I hope that window's still up. If not, it'll come back around. 